I'm Amanda Wren. I teach kindergarten at Cleveland Elementary. And I'm Juana Resendiz, and I teach at Jordan Community School. I teach third grade. And Juana jumped in and helped us at the last minute when our earlier teacher had to cancel out the one whose name you saw earlier. So let's get started. Um, I have a tech, couple of technical things to tell you. During this webinar, we really would like you to be able to participate as, as much as is possible. Um, so you can't participate by talking to us. We're going to ask you to participate by typing. And I'd love you all to look at your the boxes you're seeing on your screen. And you should have on the right-hand side a box that says Q&A or says questions, I think. And there are a few places where I'm going to ask you to type something into the question box. Um, I actually, I'm going to go to the next slide where I'm going to ask you to do that. Um, our focus, as I said, is, is number sense. And I'd love you to type a word or phrase about what you think number sense means. And I apologize. It says here that to type it into the chat box. Um, and it's actually called the question box. So please look for the question box and type a word or phrase that answers this question, what is number sense? So it's a, a phrase, the phrase number sense we use often in education. Um, and this, we're hoping that this is going to help us test the system and make sure that it's working. But so far, I'm not seeing any responses. Um, I'm seeing some, some things go by. Oh, OK. But I can't read them very fast. Uh, All right, well, I'm going to come over there. All right. So some people are asked, saying that it's children's ability to know how numbers work and what they represent. Mm -hmm. Deep understanding of quantity. Um, Place value, so there's a lot of things people are thinking about what, what, what it is that numbers mean. So to think a little bit more about that, we'll, we'll come back to that, and, and we'll probably have some more answers a little bit later. So to think a little bit more about that, we have an activity that we want to do. I'm trying to get to the right slide. Here we go. All right, you saw one quickly already, because I'm having a little trouble with my controls. But here we go. So I'm going to flash some slot, some uh, dots very briefly on the screen. And I want you to type how many you see into that question box. So is everybody ready? How many did you see? If you can type that into the question box, that would be really helpful. There we go again. How many did people see? Usually this is a pretty easy one. It's four dots. It's represented it's in a square like we see on um, it's, it's represented as a square, so it's pretty easy to see the four. So we're going to try that again. And here we go. So I want to see some some typing in the question box, and I didn't see that before. But perhaps I'm not totally sure uh, how that works, whether people are typing and I can't see them for some other reason. So we're going to try it. Oh, there I see them. I see. Now a lot of people are saying four. I see. All right. So we're going to try it again. We're going to look at our question box better. Get rid of that. And we're going to be here. How many did you see that time? Should be another quick one. Pretty easy to see what's going on. Pretty easy to see. It's just like it was four as a square, it was three in a different shape. Everybody said three because it was a triangle. It was really easy. All right, here we go. They are going to get a little bit harder. You ready? Not really. <laughs> Not really, probably. Some people find three in a line a little bit harder than three in a triangle, but I still see a whole lot of threes coming in. All right, here we go with the next one. How many was that? Up, oh, that's going really fast. I see four, 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 four. Even though it wasn't a perfect square, people could see that four really, really easily. So this is what we call perceptual subitizing. You perceive the three or four dots intuitively and simultaneously. You just know. And we can do that with three and four. Our brains seem to be primed for that. And we can all do it pretty easily, as long as they're not overlapping each other. And we can see them separately. So we're going to try a couple more. And they are, in fact, going to get a little bit more complicated. So 
So here we go. How many did people see that time? Okay, so I'm seeing a seven, seven, I saw an eight. Seven, eight. Okay, so we're getting a little bit of variety here. All right, let's go back and look at it again. There's a triangle next to a square. So now I think now you've got a little more time to look at that. Most people are going to see that, that it is, in fact, seven, which was the majority of the answers. But it went pretty fast, and it was a big number. So some people who, who put eight maybe quickly saw it and thought of it as two squares, or who put six quickly saw this and thought it was two triangles. So let's try again. How many did you see that time? That was a little harder. OK, we're getting some eights. Seven, eight, seven, eight. So we had, we got a ten. All okay. right, eight. So we're getting a little bit more variety. If we, if we go back and look at it again, um, it's arranged in the way we often use it. If people use ten frames in the classroom, where you put five in one row and five in the other row, and if you've done that a lot, it's easy to see that it's eight because you see that there's two missing. Also, if you've played dice a lot, you might easily see that there's six, that, that arrangement we use on dice, and two on the bottom. Um, but guessing the bigger numbers, it went by really fast. And, and you cert nobody guessed a small number like three or four or five. Everybody guessed something bigger than that. It was quite obviously more than five and not more than ten. Um, so there was a lot you were still seeing. All right, another one. Is everybody ready? Here we go. How many were that time? How many were that time? a little bit more complicated. Does everybody get Okay, so we're number? getting uh, 15. Yeah, I think we're getting a lot. Let's see. Can, can I think we saw some, some 15 with a question mark. Okay, I saw 13. 13. There we go. I saw 12. Okay. All right. So if we look at it this time, I think we're getting all 15s now because you can see that there's three groups of five. We're seeing that there are, in fact, three groups of five, and you know that you can add those three groups of five together. Here we go. Last one. I didn't prep you. Here it goes. Last one. How many that time? Nine. Twelve. Nine. A lot of nines, I see. Ten. All right. So let's look back at it. It does seem like the majority was right there. There are nine, but it's much harder to see than the 15 was. 15 is a bigger number and harder to count, but because we had those three groups of five, like on dice, it was easier to see. Um, I think, Lisa, I think some people see this as three triangles. Um, you can kind of see a small triangle that's pretty classic up near the top, and then there's like a big spread out one and a squished one at the bottom. Yeah. Sometimes people see a couple of groups of four with one left over. Um, I've heard somebody say it was a, a triangle and a, and a square, or a three and a four with two left over. Okay. So there's a whole bunch of different ways that people, when they don't have time to stop and count, um, tend to see this. But it's not nearly as easy as the 15 with the three fives neatly arranged like on dice. Right. All right. So what we've just been doing with these last several slides is what we call conceptual subitizing. You perceive the parts and put together the whole. And all of this happens really quickly. It's often not conscious. It's still what we call subitizing. And this word subitizing I'm using is just a word based on the Latin word for suddenly, because you suddenly know what you see. Um, and it's a really basic part of, part of our number sense. And we wanted to give you a little experience of, of using your number sense, perhaps not in the in the way you had thought begin in the beginning of this webinar, right. what number sense was, and the you know the distinction between the subitizing and the conceptual subitizing is that the conceptual subitizing you have to know a couple of number facts, right? I mean, if you're um, you know four years old and you do recognize the four and the three, but you don't know yet that four and three are seven, then it's not obvious to you that that's seven. Right? Now you might say it's four and it's three. Right. So, so when we, we grown-ups do this and when we achieve it, we're using both the subitizing skill and our knowledge of how those numbers fit together. Right. So it's both vi visual, what we see, and mm -hmm. then internal, what we can think about. That's right. Sort of skill. So one of the big ideas about number sense that we have developed here is that the quantity of a small collection can be intuitively, intuitively 
perceived without counting. Nobody was counting one, two, three, or one, two, three, four for those those small chunks. And when we learned to put the small chunks together, again, we're not counting them. And probably most of you weren't even counting 5, 10, 15 on that bigger one with 15. You were just, you saw three fives and boom, there it was. It was 15. Conceptual multiplication. Right. Conceptual <laughs> instant multiplication. Indeed. Indeed. Yeah. So we're going to, these big ideas are going to crop up again a few times in the presentation. And our big ideas are things that we've developed here at Erickson that are really ideas for teachers. They're not so much ideas that we want children to memorize, but they're, they're ideas that we want teachers to give children opportunities to understand and explore. So they're, they're like a guidepost for a teacher. What are the central ideas in number sense? This is one of them that a teacher needs to be aware of. OK. So let's think about another big idea. Quantity is an attribute of a set of objects. So right now, we'd like you to type in the question box a word or phrase. What do you think this means, that quantity is an attribute of a set of objects? How can quantity be an attribute? What does that mean, that quantity is an attribute of a set of okay, objects? OK, I see someone said concept. Mm -hmm. We have tells you how many in a group defines how many are in a group. Uh, quantity is an adjective. Ooh, quantity is an adjective, not a noun. Very nice. Uh, create a picture. Numbers are adjectives. Defines the amount. Objects can also have other attributes, like shape. Hey, good point. All okay, right. These are good. A lot of good thinking. So let's go on and think a little bit more about this big idea, this very important big idea, that quantity is an attribute of a set of objects. Three elephants might seem obviously bigger when compared to three mice. Uh, three elephants could not fit in my living room, and three mice could probably fit in one of my shoes. If you use the attribute of size, three elephants are bigger. But if we use the attribute of number or numerosity, they are identical. So that's one way to think about this big idea. Right. When you say And when you say they're identical, uh, what we mean is the set are identical in terms of number or numerosity. And we're going we're to keep talking a little bit more about that and have another illustration here about the attribute of a set of objects that we're looking at. And this is something that got brought up in people's questions, that it's a descriptor or adjective, and it's not the only thing. So if we think about this picture of roses, what attributes does this collection of roses have? Red color is an attribute that we could use to describe this collection of roses. Round shape is an attribute that we could use to describe this collection of roses. Sweet smell is yet another attribute that we could use to describe this collection of roses. Well, if they were real. Sadly, my computer screen does not smell sweet, and yours probably doesn't either. Yeah, we need to scratch and sniff. <laughs> anyway, um, and finally, quantity is another attribute. One of many. I'm sure I could have come up with even more. Another attribute of this set of roses. There are three roses in this collection. So I think, I mean, it's this whole idea of quantity as an attribute is sort of so obvious. It's kind of duh. But the problem is that as an adult, you've gotten so used to this understanding. And, and I think the point of us having a big idea that says quantity is an attribute of a set of objects is to help remind us as adult, adults that this is learned knowledge, right? Kids come into the world subitizing, but they don't come into the world calling it three or right. calling it four. But they have they, to put that stuff together. They do have some ideas pretty early on about more and less, and which match up, and if everybody gets one, yeah. So right. they, they have this, and it's it's pretty. It's actually pretty abstract, pretty early. And we'll move on to that. Um, and numerosity is is this abstract idea that exists apart from number words or written symbols. The words and symbols vary from language to language, but the numerosity does not. We can say that there are three elements, or if we were speaking Spanish, we might say there tres elefantes. But we're still talking about the three-ness. And uh, you might understand that without having any language to represent it. It's an abstract idea. 
Um, and it also doesn't really exist in the things. It exists in our grouping of the things, unlike some other attributes. And humans seem to be biologically programmed to automatically perceive the numerosity of small sets. So I have another thing I'd like you to do in the question box. Well, no, never mind. <laughs> Hold that thought. Be ready to type. Um, so we, we've just talked about two of the big ideas, um, that quantity is an attribute of a set of objects, and the quantity of a small collection can be intuitively perceived without counting. And they're part of this larger set of big ideas that we have developed. And this first slide are big ideas that relate to the things we think children are thinking about in preschool and kindergarten. Although they are still important things to be thinking about as children get older and even as adults, thinking about what does it mean that quantity is an attribute and that it's abstract. That's something we still use in higher mathematics, but it's something we've developed um, in the early years, hopefully, and continue to develop. And then as um, children get a bit older, they think about some other ideas about number sense. And I'm not going to read all of these, and you will have them in your saved webinar. Um, but children begin to think about big ideas related to place value in base 10, um, that we group by tens, and that the positions of the digits matter. Um, children begin to think about big ideas related to fractions to wholes and units and equal parts. And all of this, it, we start with this very foundational idea that quantity is an attribute. And we use numbers to name specific quantities. And then we build this huge, amazing, phenomenally useful system out of that. Mm -hmm. Another word for this sort of aspect of number is the, the cardinal value, right? Mm -hmm. The cardinal value of number, the three, the four, what it really means. How many is it? Right. And that, also comes to play the cardinality of a fraction, you know. Oh, we're getting a comment that says, will these slides be available to us after the presentation? The pace is quite fast. OK, so that's well, helpful to us. Yeah, thank you. They will be available. And um, we're giving you a taste of some ideas and an experience of learning about math. Um, that is not, we know is faster than is ideal for learning, but we want to give you a taste that moves into understanding what's happened for teachers in the classroom. Yeah, we think it's better that you experience some math, even if it's quickly and at a surface level, the way that we tend to teach it. Because then I think you'll have a better understanding when we get to describing what it looks like in a classroom. But you will get to review these this presentation. Um, and I don't know the details about that, but the, the folks from the National Working Group will let you know at the end of the presentation. So here's my question I spoke about a little bit before. Do you think that babies under six months of age have number sense? Type yes or no in the chat box. Oh, <laughs> yes, yes, yes. No. <laughs> yes, no. Yes, no. Yes, no. So fair number of yeses, some no's. I think I primed people to think that the answer might be yes by the things that I said. Um, which is good. I'm glad to know you're paying attention. And of course, some of you might have thought about this and read about this before. So I'm going to go on and briefly. Now, and I like somebody put sort of. Um, I'm going to give it. It probably it. depends on how you define number sense. Because if you think about it as the cultural piece of the word, it's like, no. But do they have some awareness of quantity? That's what we're going to talk about. Right. That's what we're going to talk about with this next slide. Um, no, no four months I, old I know knows how to speak or sign a number reliably, but um, this is really interesting study that I'm showing you an illustration from that was done in 1992. Um, and these were four month old infants. And this slide that you're seeing now, I'm going to try to go through this slowly enough to give everyone a chance, um, shows what happened, how they, how they conducted the study. So if you're looking at the top row of little pictures, the first thing that this is, and this is what the baby is seeing. There's a baby strapped in a little comfy chair, watching things on a screen, and they have those fancy psychological things that help them record how much the baby is sucking, which shows interest in where the baby's eyes are pointing. Yeah, and actually, I think it's live. I think they're seeing this live, not on the screen. Oh, that I yeah, think it's a real correct. object. But they're not where they, they can't touch it. No, they can't You're touch right. it. Right. Jennifer's right. She corrected me, and she's right. It's live, but they can't play with these things. They're removed from it in that way. But right. 
happening they're with actual objects. Yep. So they see a toy placed on this little puppet stage, and then a screen goes up, and then they see a second object moving with the hand behind the screen, and the hand going back empty. OK, so the screen goes up, right? And that object is still back there. And then they see the hand coming back in with yet another object. Is that right, Lisa? That's right. And then they see the hand removing empty. OK, the hand goes away. So empty. then so. there's still the blue screen and no hands, and the screen drops. And the bottom shows two things. Some babies got to see one thing, and some babies got to see the other. And on the left is the possible sensible outcome, which is the screen drops, and there's now two of the toys, two objects visible. And babies did not seem terribly extra interested in that. It seemed as if they expected it. They just kind of kept sucking and looking a little. But when the screen dropped and they saw something that was impossible, or was made possible only through the experimenter's trickery, but something that they wouldn't expect, they, they seemed to be puzzled. They looked harder and longer and sucked more. So it appeared that these four muscles really were developing a sense of quantity, not a sense of numbers in terms of a system or names, but a sense of quantity at this early age and understanding that if there's one and there's one more, it should not look like two and not not look like one. Yeah, and I think that you know, this experiment kind of defines that sense of quantity as the ability to mentally represent two-ness, right? Because when the baby is seeing the blank screen, if they, if they know what it should look like, what they're able to remember is that there ought to be two of those things back there, or something like it, OK? So, so they're reacting to something that we think is probably quantitative. So that's the very beginning of number sense that most babies seem to have, at least the babies they've brought into the laboratory. Um, and it makes sense that you know evolutionarily, I mean, that it would be important or that it could be useful, right? I mean, at least to know more and less, to have that Absolutely. distinction. You know, where is there more shade? Where is there more so grass? Then the question is, yeah, where does it go after that? Um, older infants often learn the signs or words for more and all gone before any other ideas. It seems to be something that they're still thinking about, having more, having none. Um, and one-year-old can tell that a pile of five is more than a pile of two even though they don't know any number names. They can't tell you how many more. But if they have the same type of object, they will pick the pile of five or six as more than the pile of, of two. Um, and by the second half of the second year, most toddlers can understand and follow if you ask them to take one or give one or take two or give two. And they usually have words for one and two. They often do not have, in that first year of a lot of speaking, words for three or bigger. Um, I actually heard a wonderful story. Someone told me after I used this very same slide talking to a group of people about number sense that her granddaughter um, went through a brief phrase where she would say one, two, and then two, two for three, and then more two if it was more than three. And it only lasted for a little while, and she learned more words oh, wow. and one, two, bigger. So she, that's so cool. <laughs> milking everything she got. Um, and then preschoolers you know, build on this, and they really are building a firm sense of the numerosity of 3, 4, and 5. It doesn't mean that we think preschoolers only count, but we're not really going to talk about counting skills today. It's like a whole other kettle of fish related to number sense. Most preschoolers, by the end of preschool, have learned a lot of number words, and many of them learn them in order. But really understanding the numerosity and how they go together and break apart that 3 is 3, and that 3 is 2 and 1, and that 4 is 4, and 4 isn't 2 and 1, 4 is 2 and 2, or 4 is 3 and 1 more. Um, they really get can get that for 3, 4, and 5. And they can do things with other numbers, like count objects, and, and say, if you put 10 in front of them, and, and they've learned those words, and they carefully count them, that it's 10. But they usually can't fiddle around with the bigger numbers so well. And to have a lot of experiences with these little numbers really gives them a very strong number sense. And then with kindergartners, they solidify the near, their numerosity and sense of number combinations um, going up to 10. And, and a lot of the kindergarten year is really building from fives onto 10. Isn't that right, Amanda? Very true. 
<laughs> um, and first graders, you know, if they've got that solid sense, can build, again, to, to have a sense of what the numbers really mean up to 20. And what we're really trying to say here is there's a distinction about um, really understanding the numerosity of these numbers and, and how to use them and just being able to say the number words and even count something out, what, what that means changes. Lisa, we've got a question. Um, what effect would the child's environment and experiences have on this? Do you want to take a stab at that? Well, I think there are young children um, have, there is some of this natural sense of the, those small numbers, but I do think the flexibility of thinking about number combinations and really building on that in the preschool and kindergarten years there's an effect of the environment if anybody ever asks about that. Um, and sometimes uh, in preschool and kindergarten classrooms, teachers focus a lot on counting out the right number or doing some basic addition and getting the right answer. And they may discourage children's interest in the playing around with the numbers. Um, so there definitely is some influence on how people talk to children about numbers. I do think pretty much most three-year-olds are going to be able to see the difference between one and two and three and, and have those words for it, where we go from there can have can certainly have a lot to do um, with how grown-ups talk to them. I want to add a, an example. Do we have time for that, Lisa? Just sure. Take a minute. Um, so there's a study uh, done by some people at the University of Chicago quite a few years ago, actually, um, that found a socioeconomic difference at kindergarten. So what happened was um, they would start with word problems. So they'd say, what's three plus one? Or I had three apples and I got one more. How many do I have? Okay, so those are problems that are math problems presented through language, through words, right? And then they would present um, another problem, which was the same math, the, the three plus one, but they did it by putting out three objects, putting up a screen, and adding one more. And then telling the child to make their mat that was right in front of them looked like they think the one behind the screen looks right now. And what they found was that kids from um, less advantaged backgrounds were able to do the thing with the screen and the dots. They were able to make four on their mat just fine. But the word problems, they were nowhere near as good as the kids who had a lot more advantages. Which, well, or, or I'm not sure. Which is which is an advantage. I think that uh, huh. that there is they had a less rich language skills, well, but perhaps different, different perceptual skills. Sometimes, I know some well, studies true, have too. shown that that uh, the language development um, isn't doesn't that some children who have limited language may all actually be able to solve problems in a different way. They just can't tell you with words how they did it. Mm -hmm. um, so that which in school we hope people can tell about words. Mm -hmm. So we're gonna. Going to move on now, and I, I just put up the the last statement that second and third graders are using this number since they've developed to become much more flexible and efficient solving problems using operations and much bigger numbers. So we earlier showed you um, our big ideas for, uh, for the basic foundation of number sense, and I'm showing them again here. and mapping them to some key skills, because the idea is the underlying concepts that the child must be understanding in order to do something, and then the skills are what they can do. Um, so the understanding that quantity is an attribute of a set of objects, and that small collections can be intuitively perceived without counting, come out to for children naming the quantity of sets and moving on to conceptual subitizing. Um, and then another one that we haven't spoken about so much today is composing and decomposing the numbers. Um, and I guess we have spoken about it. I just didn't read out that big idea. Um, leads to fluency in composing and decomposing numbers. And one of the things that, that we work on in our work of helping people understand foundational math is understanding the math and then also understanding how children think about it. And then what do you see or hear? What's happening? And another tool for that. Um, I'm waiting for my slide to change. Another, oops. <laughs> Another tool for that is something we call the landscape of learning. It's a tool that we um, got from a group called the Young Mathematicians at Work. Um, it's a group in New York City. And 
you, you'll have to look at this more carefully um, <laughs> when you can expand it. I think when you get get, but I wanted to give you the idea. It's a tool for taking this learning that we've been doing, and yes, we've been doing it fairly quickly. We've uh, taken you through in, in 30 minutes something we might spend two two hours on if we were doing a really in-depth professional development, but we wanted to explain to you how our whole project worked. Um, and it's another way to think about it, and you see it looks really busy. It's because there's a lot of ideas and models and strategies that children may be following along as they get to a complete under a, a solid number sense and a good understanding of addition and subtraction. So this is a landscape for number sense, addition, and subtraction in particular. There are other ones that cover other topics. Um, and it's essentially developmental in that the ideas, the strategies, models, and concepts at the bottom of the page are those that children usually acquire first or use first. Um, but I, we like the idea of the landscape because it suggests that there are multiple routes to the same destination. And our experience of the way children develop is that it's extremely variable and that it is very difficult to predict what is the next thing that someone should be learning based on what they know. And even that, what does it mean to know something? I mean, with, with very young children, it's, it's often something they can do and then they can't do the next minute. And I noticed there's a question about getting a printout um, on the screen. And you'll get this when you get the recording. I have the website where I. I got this from, and you can see other ones there. So when you get a chance to look at that more closely, you can grab that website. Go to that website, yeah. So I want to tell you a little bit about what the, what our group is, the Early Math Collaborative. And I'm going to advance to the next slide, I think. <laughs> So Jennifer, tell us a little bit about the beginning of the Early Math Collaborative. OK, well, um, we're here at Erickson Institute, which is a graduate school in child development in Chicago. So that means there are a lot of people coming here to get master's degrees to work with children and families between the age children, that is, between the ages of 0 and 8, and their families. Um, and our project trains teachers. So most of what we do is we train teachers who are currently in service working in school. Oh, here we go. Look at that. Um, so we do that really through three different mechanisms. We do the professional development. We also conduct research. And most of our research is about teacher ed, teacher development, um, how do teachers learn, uh, what do teachers understand, and what does their practice look like. Those are all questions that we're interested in. And then finally, we try to provide information. So we have a, a pretty uh, rich website that has a lot of video um, we have a book out, and we're trying to write another one, and trying to be somebody who can curate some information and really bring together advances in research and our understanding of teachers and classrooms and, and make practice better. So we're trying to move to the next slide. We'll see if we can make that happen or not. Um, but in the meantime, I want to give you a brief overview of our work. Um, we started in 2007. Originally, we were working with pre-K and kindergarten um, teachers in the Chicago public schools. Um, since then, we've expanded. Uh, and we've done work with all the way up to fifth grade. Uh, we've worked in a lot of different settings. So for um, charter schools and child care centers um, and places in Kentucky and New Jersey, uh, Children's Museum, and so forth. Um, and then we also have been working with other people who train. So uh, people who train teachers and people who teach at community colleges. Um, it, that's some of our more recent work trying to figure out how do we take what we're doing in terms of the, the professional development and, and help someone else to deliver that same, that same kind of an, a learning experience for teachers. Um, so I want to tell you a little bit about one of the projects, the one that was highlighted in green in the last screen. Um, and I'm having a little trouble with my controls, as you can see. Sorry about that. Um, <laughs> so it's called the Innovations Project because it's from a grant that we got called Invest in Innovations from the federal government. 
$6 million funded by the U.S. Department of Education plus a grant, generous grant from the CME Group Foundation. And it's a four-year school-wide intervention in eight schools. And the teachers that you heard from earlier and briefly recently um, are going to be sharing, who are going to be sharing with you are from these schools. And I want to tell you um, very briefly a little bit about what we have been doing with these teachers. They receive uh, training. That We've got several different aspects to our training. Um, at the heart of it is our conceptual framework, which is the whole teacher approach. In early childhood, we talk about teaching the whole child, which means that you um, don't just teach knowledge. You have to think about their affect, and you have to think about their, their physical self. Um, and so in the whole teacher approach, we're trying to think about teachers' knowledge, but also think about their attitudes. That's really important in mathematics, um, and to make sure that we're really looking at their practices. So keeping that in mind, there are four different kinds of intervention that we use. Learning labs is when um, teachers come together at Erickson, so we get them out of their school setting. Uh, the point is to deepen mathematical understanding and get them excited. We also try to model uh, the instructional strategies that we hope that they're using in their classroom and really give them a chance to participate in a mathematical learning community so they know what it's like. Um, once you've experienced it, then you want to make one in your classroom. Um, and then uh, we also do individualized coaching. So we have math coaches who are visiting teachers at their schools, uh, supporting them to implement new um, strategies and to really reflect on their own practice and, and make their, their practice something that can be constantly improved. And then two other parts of that, of our PD, are grade level meetings at the schools where the coaches who work sometimes one-on-one -on -one with teachers sit down with a group of teachers all the third grade teachers or all the kindergarten teachers or all the first grade teachers about once a month to help build a community of practice there. And this is really how we're hoping that our intervention will continue after there is no more money to pay for us to do it, that the teachers mm -hmm. at the school will have be able to take on themselves the jobs of talking to each other about math. Um, and the final part that doesn't directly involve the teachers is what we call um, a leadership academy where we ask principals and also some assistant principals to come here to Erickson and, and learn a bit more about what good math looks like and what math is so that they develop their math eyes and they have a network um, of administrators so they can talk with each other and learn more. Um, so now we want to talk a little bit after we've given you a taste of what we do for teachers, helping them think about math and helping them think about children. And we've told you a little bit about all the places we've done that. And now we're going to invite two of our teachers from this Innovations Project to talk to us a little bit about what they've learned and how their practice has changed. And first up is Amanda Wren, who's a kindergarten teacher at Cleveland Elementary School here in the Chicago Public Schools. And so really the first thing I think we want to hear about, Amanda, is um, to what degree your understanding of the math has changed, um, and in what way? Well, as I was thinking about how I thought about number sense um, before I became involved with Erickson, it was mentioned before that kindergarten is um, focused on the numbers 1 through 10 a lot and being flexible with that. And I think my idea of number sense was that um, I could tell if the student knew the number, if they could name the number, and if they could join two numbers together and come up with the right answer. So you mean like name the numeral? Yes. Yeah, like like the written the numeral three. and no recognize it? Exactly. And then what was the other piece? Put numbers together? Mm -hmm. like Be able to take two numbers that they could name and then tell me what they were if they were joined together, like in addition. So two and three together is five? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so thinking back, and then as I've um, been able to learn from the PDs and from my coaches, I've developed a deeper sense of um, all the different things that come before and add to and make up a child's number sense. Mm. And so it's allowed me to deepen my own understanding of what we can do with numbers and what numbers um, mean to a child and to myself as well. Mm -hmm. So as I um, implement that in the classroom, I realize that I am able to know more of what to look for as the child is explaining their thinking about a number mm -hmm. um, and the different clues I can um, look for as 
as you guys saw, the landscape of learning is very, uh, it's not linear and it's not like a um, rigid sequence where I can teach the kids, okay, now they have this, so now I can move on to this, but it's going to look different for each child, so I'm more aware of what I can be looking for um, in order to move them up that landscape of learning. And, and when you started the project, you were a second year teacher, is that right? Yes, it was actually um, perfect timing for me because I was still developing um, my teaching philosophy and my practices, and so as I was learning with Erickson, um, it was really perfect because I could implement the things that we were learning in the classroom right away and try new things and um, to figure out like what it meant for the kids in my class, the things that um, research was saying. And I think you have an example to share with us. And I hopefully do. my pictures are going to work. Yes. Well, in our classroom, um, we start each morning. You'll see hopefully a picture soon, but we call it our Rec and Rec attendance chart. And it's, um, so Rec and Rec is a tool we use in math. And it has five white beads and five red beads on the top row. And then there's the same set of 10 beads on the bottom row. So it makes up 20 total. Um, but we've also taken that concept and turned it into a chart where children can put their um, names on a stick and then put it in one of the slots each morning um, just to record their attendance um, and to well, let how them many, know. How many kids are in your class? This year we have 24. OK. And so your rec and rec chart on the wall has like, I saw it, it has three rows of 10, right? Yes, that's true. Five red and five white on each row? Yes, so we modified it so it could be up to 30. Okay, and little um, pockets, right? Yes, mm -hmm. so little pockets they can slip their name in. So that's the first step in the morning. Um, and then as we gather as a group and start talking about um, just daily routines, we move the Rec and Rec attendance chart over and the kids have a chance to show me um, and the rest of the class, how they can figure out how many kids are with us today. And the beauty of the Rec and Rec is that because kindergarten, um, it's really important to be flexible with those fives and tens um, and be able to show how they can see it in different ways. The kids have a chance to um, not only explain their thinking, but also build upon each other's strategies of, oh, I see that the first two rows are all filled in with name sticks, so I know, you know, that if it's 10 and 10, that's 20. Mm -hmm. um, but then another child might see, oh, well, um, I see there are five here and two on the red, so that mm -hmm. would be seven. And so just showing the different ways that they um, are familiar with the numbers. So the structure of the red and the white pockets kind of helps them group the number of kids into these fives and ten groupings. And so the conversation ends up being about that. Yes. And one thing I also love about it is it's um, accessible to the kids no matter where they are in their understanding of number sense because you can um, still be working with cardinality and count each number up to the last number, which was 23 on the day that the picture um, Yay! shows. <laughs> um, and then so they can use that. So what's that little girl on the left saying in the picture? Um, she was just demonstrating her excitement over <laughs> um, the realization that if all 10 sticks are filled um, on a row, then it's easy to know it's 10. And so that's an efficient strategy that she can use um, to show the class how, to, how she figured out the total. And I'm going to move back now that I figured out a little tool to try this. This is just showing that the children, they come in and they just put them wherever they want to. Yes. Yeah. And so when it gets to the point that all 23 children are there, it might not be all organized like this at first. Right. So if it's not organized at first, then what do you do? Um, sometimes um, a child will volunteer, oh, let's make it easier to count. Mm -hmm. so other kids who are more interested in showing their um, creativity in counting <laughs> or something <laughs> that they've been thinking about will leave them there. And then show the different ways they grouped them in their mind. Oh, like we were doing, talking about the dot display, right? Yeah. And we were, some people see it as four and three, and so the kids might see it in different ways. Yes. Great. So then you make sure that there are multiple ways, and you always, mm -hmm. you always try to ask more than one child how they figured out the number? Yes, that's become a big deal as someone um, being able to offer a new strategy or build upon another student's um, strategy, and they love to show the different ways. and. Um, 
And I, you told a story before about the picture on the right-hand side, um, the two children both putting their hands up on there, and, and what was happening there. So the first child on the left had come up and um, demonstrated to the class how she was going to count by fives, because she knows five reds and five whites. And then the second child, um, while the first student was still up there, raised his hand and said, well, I like that, um, I like her strategy, but I also see how we could use it in a different way. And so he chose to do it by the fives that were the same color. And then we talked about how they ended up with the same answer, but got there a different way. Okay, that's awesome. Thank you so much, Amanda, yeah. for sharing about what you're doing in kindergarten. Yeah. And now we're going to turn to Juana Ascendis. Thank you. Um, from Jordan Elementary School, who teaches third grade and has also been participating in our project um, for the last three years. So Juana, maybe you could start by, um, as Amanda did, talking a little bit about how your own personal sense of what number sense is has shifted a little bit. Sure. Um, I was born in a different country. I was born in Mexico, and I was telling, I was sharing with them previously about how I thought I knew how to do math and like how I thought I was good in math, but I didn't really have number sense. I learned the steps to solving problems. I learned the steps of how you solve it in an efficient way, but it didn't really make sense in my head. Like, I just knew the procedure to get to an answer. And when I started teaching, this is my eighth year teaching, sixth year teaching, six, uh, third grade, I, in the beginning, that's how I was teaching my students. Like, this is how you do it, step by step. But I realized that my students were learning the procedure of doing things, but not necessarily understanding what they were doing. Mm -hmm. So now, now because I have a better number sense, I can explore with, with my, my students how to teach them to be flexible with numbers, how to teach them to compo decompose and compose numbers, how to teach, I'm teaching them now how to represent it in different ways and teach them different strategies that they can actually implement in different uh, problems as I teach every day. So. Something interesting in what you said, and then I want to ask a little bit more, mm -hmm. but it sounds like you're saying that your, your knowledge about number makes it possible for you to teach in a different way that yes. still you have that kind of understanding yourself, you really couldn't have opened it up to other strategies, for example. Is that and, correct? Yes. And one thing that you had shared with us that, that I put on the slide is this understanding about numbers not just being a unitary thing, that mm -hmm. you could express 20, the example I gave, that you could express 20 as 80 less than 100, or 5 more than 15, or 2 tens, or more and more ways. Right. And before, like I said, I knew the steps to solving problems, mm -hmm. but I didn't really understand what it meant. Mm -hmm. And now coming to Erickson for it, all these uh, workshops and having my coaches, I, I had the luxury of having three different coaches throughout <laughs> the year, which was really good because I learned something new from each one of them. Just understanding myself what the students are explaining, I'm more open to sitting there and modeling their strategies. Yeah, and I was reluctant in the beginning of, well, yeah, that sounds great, but I really don't understand what you're saying. So now having a better um, number sense myself really allows me to model their thinking. And it's not just what they're telling me, but when I see my other students getting confused with it, I can stop and I can explain it to them with my own words that I know it might be easier for them to understand instead of just, oh, yeah, I made five circles. Well, what do the five circles represent? Mm. Things like that. Yeah. So, so it seems to me like you feel that you have changed your teaching about number sense because you've used your own new thinking about number sense. Right, absolutely. And the, um, five years ago, six years ago, when I started teaching math, uh, or in third grade, I just told them, this is how you do it, and this is how it works. <laughs> Don't ask questions. Just do it this way because this is a way that you're going to get to the right answer. Now I don't even tell them how to get to the right answer. I start my, my routines every day with having a number talk. I just put something up on the, on the board and then we solve it with, with different strategies and my students share their strategies and they understand that it's more than one way to get to the right answer. And it's not about, my students will say, I know you're not looking for the right answer, you're only looking for the strategies, how we can get there. And yes, I can model two or three. Two years ago, it became really overwhelming having so many strategies and not knowing which one was better for them. So through one of your PDs that I came here over the summer, they, or they were telling us, yes, you can have 20 strategies, but you need to think about which one works for them. 
hmm. narrow it down to two or three that are going to be more efficient for most of them instead of having just get skin but be very creative with numbers and start going in different directions but then you lose them huh. you just have to concentrate on the strategy that you know are more effective for all of them so we have a couple of examples of these sorts of number talks and problems that Juana was talking about that you can see this is things that you want to you wrote while the children were speaking to you right so I started my my math block it's uh, 75 minutes and I started the, the first 10 or 15 with a number talk and I just wrote 8 times 6. And half of my class already knows that it's 48, but they were not allowed to say that. So they had to prove that that was the right answer. So someone started with, well, you can make eight circles. And if, if you notice, I made a mistake and I was putting eight little lines on it. And then one of my so students... the child said, um, Mr. Sendiz, mm -hmm. you can make eight circles and put six in each one. Right. And that will show how many. But by accident, you... I did eight, and they were like, uh, you, I think you made a mistake. I'm like, what do you mean? And I didn't even recognize my own mistake. I didn't even notice it. And so they were like, well, you have eight circles. You cannot have eight dots in it because you have eight times six. <laughs> so I was like, oops, I'm sorry. So, yeah, I fixed my mistake. You said it led to an interesting conversation that one child said you could have made six circles with eight in it. Right. So... Um, we were talking about how to place numbers for number models, and one of my really smart girls said, well, if you have plain numbers, you can switch them around because there's no story that goes with it. If you have what kind of numbers? Plain or naked numbers, as we plain call them. Plain numbers, ordinary numbers, naked numbers, numbers that are, we're just talking about the number and we're not right. talking about what it means in the world. Right. So she pointed out, she said, you can switch them around because we know that we call them the turnaround shortcut for multiplication. Mm -hmm. And I'm trying to develop like a better vocabulary with them. Mm -hmm. So we're changing a few of the words that we use in class. But for now, they knew it was called the turnaround shortcut. So we proved it. And you can see on the tape diagram underneath, we counted by 6, 12, 18, 24. And then someone said, well, you can also make six boxes and come by eight. So I model, and all of the things that you guys are seeing on the screen are things that my students are telling me to do. I tell them, I'm your writer. You tell me what to do, I will do it. Because these are your So strategy. that's why you go ahead and cross it out, because mm -hmm. they had said make eight circles and put six in each. Exactly. And then you were fixing it because they said, wait, you, you mm -hmm. Now, if a child had said, and maybe sometimes this happens, make eight circles and put eight in each, then that would have been recording what they did and hopefully in the right. conversation with the children someone would have said, oh, that's too many. Even. Right, exactly. So um, I modeled their strategies and then are we going to see the next picture? Yes, and okay. we're going to go on. So this is a number talk where you're re really trying to get children to think about this, this number fact that 8 times 6 equals 48 or 6 times 8 equals 48. And then... Oh, and I, by the way, I don't write the answer until we prove it two or three different ways. <laughs> so you, write, the, you write down that 8 times 6, six and just leave it blank. Times 8, mm -hmm. and leave it blank, and then they have to prove it, and then you right. all agree on the 48. Mm -hmm. Right, and the second um, slide that you guys are seeing right now, it's uh, my students were having a difficult time with writing number models for division problems. So I gave them the word problem on the top, and I like to start my, my lesson. I'm just going to read it if it's hard for you to see right. it. Mary had 28 tickets, and she wanted to share them with seven friends. And how many tickets does each friend get? Right. So they were, have, they were able to answer the question. They were able to show it with a number, uh, with a picture, a proof picture, or picture proof, as some people call it, or an array. They were able to do all of that. But the number model didn't really match what the students were doing or the pro what the problem was saying. Mm -hmm. So what I did today, I decided to use the same problem, and I'm using the same numbers underneath. It says Mary had 28 tickets, and she gave four tickets to each friend. How many friends got tickets? Right. And those two problems, it, we took like 35 minutes just mm -hmm. solving those problems. Mm -hmm. And it seems like a long time, but we have very good conversations about why does it work on the top when we do it this way, when it is 28 divided by 7. And why I cannot write the same number model for the second problem. And we were looking at how are they the same, how are they different, using math in real life. Like, how is this helping you understand math? What do you know? I teach bilingual. So a lot of my students, their English is very limited. So taking step by step the problem and seeing what do you see, how do you, what do you visualize, 
what are, how are you going to solve the problem? I don't start with a strategy that I want to teach them. I say, okay, here's the problem. How can we solve it? And then they share what they know. And then you, a day after you've done this, you might have thought about what they know, and you use that to make up your problem for right. the next day or the next week. And those problems I made on, based on their homework. Because I noticed they got the right answers, but their number models didn't really match what the problem was saying. Oh. So that's what drove my lesson for so them. They, know, they knew a number fact, like 28 divided by 7 mm -hmm. or 18 divided by 3, but the picture they drew didn't seem to fit with the way the word problem had The described. picture was fine. It was just a number model underneath. It was a 28 divided by... I So, so the, there's, you're saying there's just a lot of complicated parts right. to that. Mm -hmm. And so your understanding of those complications and the need to model and write and let kids build by right. different problems has all arisen out of... And I'm pretty sure in the past, before taking this classes at Erickson and all of this, I'm pretty sure that I was okay with just getting the right answer. Mm -hmm. But now it's not about just getting the right answer. It's about really understanding what is going on in the problem, really understanding what the problem is asking you, how you're going to model it, how are you going to prove that's the right answer, and the students being able to identify when it's a set of things that you're putting together, what is the set of things that you're separating, where is the set of things, what numbers really mean. Mm -hmm. right. so, so, and what is that at the bottom of the page there? Oh. Um, I gave them, uh, what well, we call them again, naked numbers, and I used exactly the same three numbers that I used mm -hmm. on the top. Mm -hmm. And my students now are able to come up with their own uh, division problems, multiplication problems. So I said, okay, tell me a story with using so three one, numbers. One of them is Carlos has seven boxes of books, and each box has four books. And how many books does he have in all? And another one is that there's seven boxes and 28 books in those seven boxes, and how many books are in each box. And so they came right. to someone with a multiplication problem and a division problem. And they were able to tell me, that's a multiplication problem because of this. This is a division problem because of that. So there's, we've gotten an interesting picture of number sense being played out in third grade. Thanks, Juana. And no in problem. kindergarten, thanks, Amanda. And if we want to think back way to the beginning, um, you know, before kindergarten, this is being built with some very small numbers. And for instance, in preschool, we might start to build this by asking children to show us three on their fingers. And they might hold up the th three fingers, their thumb and their index finger and their um, middle finger, and, and show that it's three. And some of the ways we can have children be more flexible is sometimes hold up different fingers. Or be we begin this by asking children, can you show me three on two hands? And that kind of question, that's really one of my favorite preschool um, and early kindergarten number sense activities is asking children to show numbers on their fingers more than one way and using one hand or two hands. And that kind of thing is what eventually leads to children being mm -hmm. able to model multiplication when they're in third grade. Well, one of the things that we haven't talked about so far in our discussion on number sense is the common core. Um, of course, that's not being adopted in every state in the nation, and I know that, that they're controversial for some folks. But I would say that overall, uh, the Common Core practice standards are really focused on kids' thinking mm -hmm. and the process of doing the math. Um, and they emphasize flexibility uh, and a fluent kind of understanding, the ability to, to really generalize the knowledge, going deep as opposed to surface. Um, and I think that we chose number sense because it's so core um, to all the math experiences that children will have. There are certainly other important uh, content areas in mathematics. Um, but I think number sense gives you a nice way to think about the pre-K to third grade span, right? And, for, and I was just speaking about fingers, but those dot cards that we were using before, those, again, are a great tool that can be used in preschool, in kindergarten, in first grade, in second grade, in third grade, and I've actually seen people do amazing dot card math talks with middle schoolers, too. Um, but with the, the youngest children, you simply might start by building on that sense of numerosity and in having a matching game that isn't about having two identical cards, but having two cards that have the same numerosity. So three that are in a line and three that are in a triangle, mm -hmm. four that are in a square and four that are in a line, maybe two different colors of each, or there's a lot of different ways you could make dot arrangement cards of those numbers just from one to five and ask people to build it. And then as they, they get older, you might be 
using those dots to build that conceptual number sense with an array that let them quickly see how many and multiply it out or with different dice arrangements and they're knowing their addition facts. So that's the kind of thing that, that really builds. Because number sense is really about thinking and making sense about our number system and number situations and what we can do. Um, so as I, I said a few moments ago, we've given you the whirlwind tour of the Early <laughs> Math Collaborative, both what we do and um, who we are and how it has been working out in the Chicago Public Schools. Um, and as you can tell from what we've done, we, we are about the early math, what is math, early on and foundationally, and we're also very much about collaboration, that we work together in a variety of ways to build the number sense of teachers so that they are building the number sense of children, and again, in other areas of mathematics. So we'd like to, to take a few moments um, to find out if you have questions that you would like um, me or Jennifer or Amanda or Juana to, to answer about what we've been talking about. And I know we've talked about a lot of things, but we really wanted to, even so I feel like we've only um, given you very much the tip of the iceberg, but we wanted to frame the whole picture for you. So this is the time, if you have a question, um, to go ahead and type it in the question box, and we'll keep an eye on that and see if something comes up because we'd, we'd really be glad to have that kind of interaction going on. But in the meantime, um, I wanted to ask, uh, Amanda, maybe would you mind if I ask you um, to tell us just a little bit about how, what parts of the work that we did together you think might have been most important for, for you? Because I bet it's different for different teachers. Mm -hmm. but, but for you to, to learn what you needed to learn and, and change your own teaching practice, mm -hmm. What part of, of the professional development was most helpful? I think um, what well, I learned a lot each time we met at Erickson, and probably like a lot of people are feeling now, it's a lot to take in. Mm -hmm. And um, I think the most important part for me to be able to apply that to my classroom instruction um, was to be meeting with my coach and um, also grade level meetings with the two other kindergarten teachers at my school because it gave us a chance to sit down together, look at student work, figure out what was really going on in their minds, um, and then plan our instruction accordingly to that. Because usually it's really hard for us to find time to sit down together and um, see what's happening in other classrooms and um, find areas that we need to support the kids. Mm -hmm. So that was really a good um, discipline to start meeting with each other and really taking a close look at the work. Hmm. Thank you. Uh, how about you, Juana? What um, what would you say was important? And I remember you saying you were reluctant, right? Yes. At first, um, I think you said something like, um, uh, "But why should I? Why should I change the way I'm teaching?" Right? It but, worked for me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Right. I, think, you know, I think we know that yeah. you really did change, and I think we have a sense of what yes. you did. Um, but but what do you think was was important about um, the way that we did the the work together that helped you? I think it's very similar to what Amanda just said, um, having a routine of meeting with other teachers and talking about the work. But I think what I, I enjoy the most was is, is actually right now meeting with my coach, mm -hmm. like having a one-on-one -on -one with her, mm -hmm. having this conversation, very rich conversation about what multiplication really means mm -hmm. and how I can actually teach her in my classroom. It's not about necessarily getting the strategies of how I teach it, but get my own understanding and what it means and how I can apply it and how I can deliver that to my students. Because mm. I think we all learn how to do certain things in life, but it doesn't really mean that we understand them. It's just more about understanding the concepts myself and the content and then being able to explain it to my students. That's interesting. So it sounds like what you're getting from your coaching, at least right now, is a depth, the depth of the content, right? So yes. I mean, these math coaches, let me tell you, it is hard to find people who bring together the kind of classroom experience that you need to be a coach to be able to help a lot of different teachers mm -hmm. and have that math content. So I, I feel really good about the people that we've got on our team, and I know you've got a terrific coach. Yes. Um, I wonder, though, if there are times when the coaching really is more about strategies or more about um, ways to organize things or and if that's useful, too. Or maybe it really the math content is key. I'd, I'd just love to know what you both think. Well, um, I, I would say it has 
it has both components in it. It's not just the content, but it's also the delivery of the strategies that I can model with my students. So she's been teaching us how to represent numbers for the students so they can actually have a better sense of what number, number sense is. Oh. But uh, it's, she does it in such a way that it's more for me <laughs> and I interpret that for my students. It's not like, this is how you do it, Juana, this is how you teach it, but look, this is what it means, this is how you can show it, and then I take that and make it my own and show it to my students. Right, right. So we've had a couple of questions coming in that I, I want to get to. I know it took, took people a little while to get typing. Um, one question that really relates to, in some ways to what we were just talking about is, again, a question about pre-K teachers and uh, the pre-K setting. And I mentioned the use of fingers and dot cards um, as great ways to build number sense and build on this subitizing skill. Also, any board games with dice mm -hmm. can really give chance for children to build on their skills. And I love for pre-K to make my own dice that just have one, two, and three twice. So they keep seeing one, two, and three a lot. And if they're rolling two of them, they have small numbers to combine. And all of those can give you a sense of what children are understanding. Um, and that leads to another question. Someone asked about math assessments. A couple people asked about what math assessments are useful in the early grades. Um, and I'm not going to go out there for any particular commercial publisher. <laughs> but one of the things that I think is really useful for a teacher to understand their children's math or to do the kind of um, math talk activities, number talk activities, which when in younger grades might involve um, what Amanda was talking about, using something like a rec and rec attendance chart. And you could use a similar thing with preschool, and you might use it in a different way. Instead of, of having um, the whole class be hearing about it, it might be that children go put their thing in, and the teacher with one child figures out how many kids are there that day. Mm -hmm. And that cycles through all the children, and eventually you would get a good sense after a couple of weeks about how each of your children is putting these numbers together. So you're suggesting you would do it one-on-one, -on -one right. because each one of those little short interviews would be something of an assessment. Exactly. And, and the kind of number talk that Juana talked about, which, again, there are ways to do those number talks with preschoolers and kindergartners. You can actually do dot things where you flash it and ask children how many and they show on their fingers and then you hold it up and ask them how they knew. Mm -hmm. um, and especially with the four and five, they might be talking about number combinations or, and, and you can describe what they say. And those can be good records for you to understand how children's number sense is developing. Um, and I think that's a really good sort of formative assessment. I really don't want to get behind exactly which um, Commercial assessment is best, but I would think assessments that ask children to solve problems and they give you some evidence of how they solve the problem are better than something where you just see how many right answers they mm -hmm. got. And you would need to look at the, the tools yourself. Um, mm -hmm. And then another question somebody had was, do we have any resources to recommend about number sense? Um, and there, the two that I can definitely recommend are the Young Mathematicians at Work series that we mentioned. If you look at that landscape of learning slide, it takes you to a, a website, and they have a lot of different resources, starting with younger children and moving up through, I think, middle school math in thinking about how children develop their number sense. And I, so they have books and they have videos. You can go and check that out, the Young Mathematicians at Work. Um, and I think that the website is called context of learning. But if you if you Google young mathematicians at work, you'll get there. Um, and then uh, our own website, website um, called, which is earlymath.erickson.edu. I believe that's correct. Um, but anyway, look up early Erickson Early Math or the Early Math Collaborative. We have a website and there's a lot of videos of children. There's also other activity ideas at various grade levels from pre-K through third grade. There's some book examples and how to get math out of certain books. Um, and we also, our collaborative has written a book called The Big Ideas of Early Mathematics, What Teachers of Young Children Need to Know, and you can get more information about that at the website. Um, and that goes much more deeply into the big ideas that we just touched on very briefly here. Um, <coughs> and the website is earlymath.erickson.edu. 
Um, but anyway, if you put early math and Erickson into your Google, you will definitely get there. I've tried it. Um, or our name, the Early Math Collaborative. But we have a variety of ideas there, and we can lead you to the book. Um, we really tried to make it a book that is approachable for all sorts of people, giving examples of how young children do math. Um, the examples in the, in the book are from preschool and kindergarten, but we know that many first and second grade um, and third grade teachers have also read it and found it useful for their understanding the foundation of where things go with their children. Um, so thank you very much for joining us and asking questions. And uh, I'm going to turn it back to the National Working Group folks to give you some concluding information about how it is you will get your recording of this webinar and any more information they have about upcoming webinars. Fantastic. Thank you so much uh, to all of you on the Erickson side. That was a um, thorough and interactive and fun understanding of all of your work. So we appreciate that. Uh, so we want to, as always, thank the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation for their support in helping to make the technology behind all of this happen. Um, although I have to say all of our presenters do this out of the goodness of their heart to get good information out to the field. So thank you to um, to the Early Math Collaborative and to Erickson Institute. Uh, at this point, we do not have our next series of webinars planned. However, if those of you on the phone have suggestions of what you'd like to hear more of, whether it be um, related to a specific initiative you've already heard from or other content areas that you have not heard about yet, please go to our website and you can find our email address there. Send us your suggestions, because we do plan to put together a next series of webinars um, that will be coming up this summer or late fall. So again, thank you to everyone who's participated. Thanks to our presenters. And we hope you have a great rest of the afternoon.